Welcome to the Business of Story podcast, where the world's best storytellers from business, Hollywood, and beyond teach you how to use stories to communicate and connect with your customers. The Business of Story is sponsored by ACT, the best-selling customer management software for small business, Oracle Marketing Cloud, enabling businesses to target, engage, convert, analyze, and use marketing technology to deliver a better customer experience. Sixter, helping clients maximize the impact of every single email sent. And by Zigna Labs, the real-time cross-media story tracking platform. Here's your host, Park Howell from Park & Co. And today's special Business of Story guest. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Business of Story. I'm Park Howell, and it's just great to have you here again for yet another episode with another incredible story artist from around the world, as I always say, but this one's a little bit closer to home. She reigns out of Boston. Now, we are very, very fortunate to have the first lady of content marketing, the person that Forbes magazine says the most influential woman in social media. And I can say firsthand, I saw her in action at Social Media Marketing World for the very first time, for me anyways. She had an amazing presentation called Bigger, Bolder, and Braver, how our brands can truly own social media using the power of story and just really, really great gripping content. Well, you may know who it is by now with just that quick introduction, but let me tell you, we are so fortunate to have Anne Handley on the show today. And in addition to being the first lady of content marketing, she was actually the very first chief content officer. She is the chief content officer for marketing profs, and she's the very first because she essentially invented the position. She invented the title. I mean, she is a pioneer in this area, and she's incredibly dynamic, very generous with her time and her energy and her tips, and she's going to be here. Now, she has a book out, Everybody Writes. I haven't read it yet. She's sending me a copy. I can't wait to see it, but Everybody Writes, your go-to guide to creating ridiculously good content. That's from Wiley. It's a Wall Street best journal. Wall Street Journal best <laughs> Wall Street Journal best seller. She is also a monthly columnist for Entrepreneur Magazine, a member of the LinkedIn Influencer Program, and a co-author of the best-selling book on content marketing, Content Rules: How to Create Killer Blogs, Podcasts, Videos, Ebooks, Webinars, and more that engage customers and ignite your business. And she does this all out of a tiny little house. We'll learn more about that here in today's show. So I'm so glad to have you. And without uh, further ado, let's just jump right into this one. Let's welcome Ann Hanley to the Business of Story. Broadcasting live from her tiny house in Boston. <laughs> Ann Hanley, great to have you on the show. I am delighted to be here with you. Okay, I've been listening to a few of your podcasts uh, with you on other shows, and I, you've been talking about the tiny house. I haven't seen pictures of it. Can you create a theater of the mind about the tiny house you work in there? Oh, you haven't seen a picture of no, it yet. No, no, oh. no, no. We're going to have to include one with this post when it ultimately appears then. But we um, want you to take us through it. So let us, you know, through story, show us what that house looks like. So in the morning, I exit my suburban house, better known as the big house, because I'm in the tiny house. So I leave the big house, and I walk about maybe, I don't know, 500 paces or so across the yard, and I climb up a couple of stone steps. There's sort of a canopy overhead from trees and flowers and so on. Sounds like I'm overstating. I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, and then I walk about another 500 paces, and I get to my tiny house in the backyard. I open up the tiny screen green porch. There's a double door in front of me, French doors. Um, I open up those wide and then I take uh, the chairs inside and put them out to keep the doors open. It's kind of like, you know, like in New York City when the, the fruit seller, you know, comes out and like mm -hmm. puts up the puts up the um, the metal door of his of his shop and is kind of open for business. So just that ritual of opening up the doors and, and taking my, um, you know, little metal chairs and, and putting them against the doors to keep them open so that the wind doesn't blow them closed. That's exactly what it feels like in the sense that, all right, this tiny house is now open for business. It's time to just get stuff done. Um, and then I walk in and I sit down at my desk and um, and here we are. It's a very sparsely decorated little tiny house uh, or a wee hoose because I just came from Scotland. That's what they call it over there. It's a wee hoose. Uh -huh. 
anybody from Scotland uh, is probably mocking my accent right now. <laughs> but um, but anyway, that's what it is. And it's very spare inside. It's very sparse. There is no insulation. So it's just, you know, two by fours and wood um, with a wood floor. My tiny little dog is um, underneath my desk right now. Um, and it just has literally a desk and some shelves and uh, an internet connection and electricity. And, and that's what, it. What do you do in the wintertime if you have no insulation in there? Well, there's there's electricity, so there is uh, there is heat in so here. So you have a tiny little heater? I have a tiny little of? heater that makes yeah. a, a big noise <laughs> because there's no insulation to drown <laughs> out the reverberations of it. Um, I don't come out here when it's really, really cold. Um, I'm, I sort of opt into uh, the big house at that point, so I'm only out here. Usually, like this time of year, is, I'm just in my glory. This is like and weather in Boston because it's like 80 degrees and sunny, and I love it. It. Um, but as soon as it gets, you know, anywhere below 20, I tend to just sort of stick to the big house. I got you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for taking us on that theater of the mind tour of your <laughs> tiny little house. I just love the thought of the tiny little house. Or you can just look at a photo. I mean, that's yeah, probably well, we'll do that next. But more that's expedient. Not as much fun. This is the <laughs> business of story, after all. <laughs> so, speaking of that, I understand you were the very first chief content officer ever in the entire universe. Is that right? I, mean, I believe did you so. you invent the title? I did invent the title, in fact, yes. Where did that come from? Uh, so I, previous to Marketing Pros, which is the current company that I work for, I co-founded a company called ClickZ.com uh, in 1997 when my daughter, who is now 19, was a newborn. Uh, so I founded that, and it was one of the first sources of really information for any business that was looking to market themselves on the web. You know, back then, the idea of marketing on the web was was kind of a nascent thing. You know, the World Wide Web was kind of a nascent thing. Right. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot going on. And so we started a website to help businesses figure out how to do things like create banner ads and, and put them on uh, other web properties. Eventually, we helped businesses figure out things like email marketing and listservs and that kind of thing. Uh, so it was very, very early on in, in the process. And you know, at the time, it was um, me and my then partner, and um, and he was the publisher, and I was, you know, we called it kind of editor in chief. But you know, I co-owned the company. It just didn't feel like it had the kind of gravitas that we wanted my title to have, you know, based on my contributions to the company and the fact that it was a content driven company. Uh, and so we were just sitting around one night and, um, and thought, what about, you know, chief content officer? And we were like, what was content? Is that a thing? And so, um, <laughs> we went and, and, uh, and thought, you know, this is, what it's, it's going to be what it is. Um, but, you know, this was a time when, you know, people would look at my business card and go, what's a chief content officer? You know, <laughs> what does that actually mean? Are you responsible for everyone's happiness? And I said, yes, absolutely, because content makes everybody happy. Absolutely. And you uh, come from the journalism background, right? Was it the I Boston do. Globe you wrote, wrote for? Yeah. So uh, I started my career as a business journalist and later went on to write for the Boston Globe and a bunch of other magazines. Um, I Honestly, though, I never really had the heart of a journalist. Um, I always had the heart of a storyteller. And when I would be reporting on, you know, news stories, my editors would send me to cover like a fire, for example. And I was always finding the feature story, you know, in journalism, in journalism speak, right? I was always finding the the more interesting story. I didn't report on the fire and what time it happened and how long it took for the fire crew to show up and the damage and so on. You know, it was like all that stuff that you would report on if you were just a news reporter. Like to me, the more interesting story was, you know, what about that library of books that that homeowner had? And, you know, what are they going to do now? You know, so I was always interested in sort of the underbelly of the news story, mm -hmm. the human piece of it. Um, and so you know, like I say now, I was actually a pretty terrible news reporter because, <laughs> you know, I write slowly like a lot of writers do. Um, you know, news reporters are great. They just sort of bang it out. It's all about the facts. And for me, I was always trying to conjure up more of an image in the in the reader's mind. I was always trying to tell more of a story. Mm -hmm. So I eventually they, they switched me to features um, where I, I, I lived a little bit uh, 
where I was a little happier. But, um, but you know, journalist, journalism was really never for me. Um, and then, you know, the internet happened and I thought, oh, I can do that. You know, <laughs> let's, mm-hmm. let's take what I know from the world of journalism and port it over into this thing called the internet. Um, because at the time, most of the websites were not content sites. They were, they were like brochureware sites. You know, it was just, you would go there and find out, you know, the basics of, you know, what time is a business open or, you know, where are they located? What do they look like? You know, that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And so really bringing that, that journalism background, that content mindset to businesses was what I was really interested in doing. And, and that's essentially what Click-C was all about. Gotcha. So you did not come up through the ranks of a trained marketing writer, copywriter, whatever. You really came from the journalism slash storytelling angle, saw the new platform of the interweb back in 1997, which, by the way, wasn't just a network of wires and tunnels at that point. And you right. Were, um, but now you are the chief content uh, officer for marketing profs. So yes. your whole reason for being, at least in the business world in this one area, is to teach others to learn what you've learned throughout this whole process of how to tell better stories online to engage customers, I guess, without oversimplifying. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, it's I, I am a, uh, a storyteller first, a writer first, and a marketer second, and I've sort of assumed the the skills of a marketer, you know, just basically through living in this world, you know, and, and walking this path. But at the same time, I feel like my approach is very much as a, a journalist, you know, is, is coming at it from an audience centric point of view, which is really what journalists do, as opposed to a corporate centric point of view, which is what many marketers are trained to do. And so really what I feel that I can value or what, what I offer marketers, what, what I value most is giving them that sort of mindset, you know, of really helping them to think about the content that they're producing, the stories they're telling from a customer's point of view. Um, it's the, sort of the thread that runs through everything I've ever done from, you know, from books or, or speaking or any bit of web content that I've ever published or produced or written. You know, that's always my sensibility. Think of the audience first. Mm-hmm. And why do you think uh, corporate co- corporations have defaulted to this corporate centric point of view when we know know how powerful that audience centric point of view is and what has changed to make it more important now than ever to be focused on your audience. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I think I think fear is a big part of it, you know, the the notion of telling stories to engage an audience. I mean, even though it's it's we know it on some level, I still think that it hasn't been truly entrenched within a lot of organizations. You know, a lot of organizations are still very much in the the marketing speak, you know, they're still very much into communicating through the, that corporate messaging. Um, so it's I think it's obvious to people like us who are are sort of steeped in this content world who are talking about stories story and content and, you know, all of, you know, the, and the power of that. But I don't think it's it's necessarily obvious to everybody out there. I think there's still a lot of companies that really struggle with it. And why are they still struggling with, with it? It's because, you know, marketing, this is a new skill set for marketing. You know, marketing has always been about, you know, how, how do we actually tell, um, you know, talk about ourselves, you know, in order to, to reach as many people as we can. And increasingly, you can't do that. You have to talk about why it matters to the people you're trying to reach. It's about putting your products and your services, what you do, who you are in the context that people will care about. Mm-hmm. It, it does seem so obvious to us, that, you know, those that are really thinking about story, but I will even find myself sometimes defaulting back to, oh, you know, let me tell them about this, 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 about me, 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 and then I've got to catch myself. And it's just a funny human trait, or maybe it's an a, a, a anti-human marketing trait. I don't know, but it really takes an intention to not do that, I have found, and especially in the business-to-business world. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And also, I would say, I mean, let's just face it, you are a really interesting person park so you know i understand why you would default to talking about yourself fish on uh, fish on thank you good that worked that, okay good uh no i think that's true i mean especially in the business to business world and so i think it's, that's where you see a lot of the fear you know i have friends who are content producers for these global companies and they are still hitting a lot of resistance internally to actually you know using story and content as a cornerstone of their marketing um and so or Organizations move at a glacial pace, right? They move very, very slowly. And so what we were talking about five years ago, you know, is is sort of still working 
making its way through the organization. Um, I mean, I think, you know, even five years hence, right, five years from now, I think we're, we're going to see a very different world, I hope. But, you know, there are, are there is a there's sort of a learning curve here. I think there's a lot of organizations that are not there yet. And even though if they know it intellectually, you know, they just sort of don't have the processes in place internally to really take advantage of that. Um, and that's where I think the, the fear comes in, too, because this is a whole different way of thinking about your marketing. And so the idea of taking risks with things, you know, of being a little bit bigger, bolder and braver, like I, I talk about all the time, that's really scary. Um, and invariably, after every talk I give where I'm trying to, you know, um, inspire companies to be bigger and bolder and braver, tell braver stories, you know, have bolder marketing, you know, really cut through the clutter in that way. Um, invariably, there's always that company that comes up to me afterward and sort of asks the secret question of like, yeah, but how do I sell this internally? How do I actually do this? Because, you know, I've got this boss or this client or, you know, whatever, who is just not on board. They're scared. They, always, they just want to do things. The, the way that they've always done them. And what do you tell them? What do I tell them is that you have to take risks. You have to have somebody who is willing to take a risk with you and you have to be the one sort of bringing that that idea into the boardroom, you know, into your client and say, listen, give me a little corner of the budget. Let's try this. Let's do something different. Um, I think that's one way to, to think about it. The other way to think about it is to, in, you know, this is going to sound, um, I don't know, maybe slightly mean spirited, but in, in some organizations, organizations, it really works, is to show what the competitors are doing. Because mm -hmm. if people are motivated by fear of doing something different, they're also at the same time motivated by this idea that they're going to be left behind. So there's sort of the, it's capitalizing on the other side of that fear, that if their competitors are doing it, what's the cheese, maybe we should be doing it too. Mm -hmm. Who's doing a good job right now in your mind uh, with the bigger, bolder, braver story? Mm, um, gosh, so many companies out there. I mean, I love to talk about really great work and, um, I, I mean, I could just, we could spend the next 40 minutes talking about that, but one of my favorite companies, so I think does an incredible job with this is Basecamp. Do you know Base, Basecamp at all? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's a project management software, essentially. Uh, they have what I think is probably one of the best pieces of, of, branded content out there, branded publishing out there. They publish a lovely little monthly online magazine called The Distance. Are you familiar with it at no, all? No, I'm not. No. Oh, it's it's really, really awesome. So what they do is they it's it's um it's a website and a companion podcast as well. And so they produce one long form illustrated story per month. And that story is usually about or it's always about a company that has be that has been in business twenty five years or longer and has uh, sort of thrived the old fashioned way. You know, not by taking money from Silicon Valley um, or, you know, taking any money whatsoever, but really just growing organically. Um, the companies that they profile tend to be sort of quirky and sort of interesting. So that only adds to the interest factor. Um, but I, I love what they're doing. And why does that make sense for Basecamp? Like what is the, the bigger story that, that they're telling? They're talking about, you know, sustainability, longevity. Basecamp has never taken any outside funding. And so they are profiling companies that sort of that they, they share a kind of ethos with. Mm -hmm. And it's what's nice about it is they don't put themselves at the center of the story. They put their audience, their their customer at the center of the story, and they become essentially the guide of without Basecamp. Maybe they weren't quite, you know, wouldn't be this uh, quite successful, but yes. we're here to celebrate in that success and that uh, personality of the company. Something that you had said in another uh, podcast I picked up on is the difference between being personal and being, uh, oh, what did you say? <laughs> personable, yeah. Personable and personal. And, Correct, and finding yeah. that fine line there. Correct, yeah. And so they do a nice job of being personable without going too far over. Yeah, and, and again, like we were just talking about, you know, it's not about the the technology, right? It's not about what Basecamp does. They don't even talk about, you know, what does Basecamp do for your company, you know, Mr. Donut Shop slash Laundromat, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, instead, they're talking about just the business itself. They're, they're usually super interesting businesses. Um, and so, sort of teasing out those stories that don't get told, um, you know, the reason that they're doing this is because these aren't stories that are going to be covered in Inc. Magazine or Entrepreneur because those magazines are telling the stories of the people who are taking money and growing fast and growing big, where the distance is, you know, sort of 
taking the opposite approach, right? They're saying, let's look at the value of growing slowly, right? Let's look at the value of a company that has been around for a long time and its role in the community and the difference that it's made in the lives of their customers. You know, those kinds of stories, I think, are very human, very interesting. Um, And so, like, in my mind, that's a great example of big, bold, and brave. Um, The other reason I like it is that they spend a lot of time on the storytelling aspect of it. It's, It's, you know, in our world where everybody is, like, you know, short and snappy snacky and snappy. The Mm -hmm. base camps, the distance is in depth. It's long form storytelling. um, And it's edited by a former journalist. I think she worked for the Chicago Tribune, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, She's a great writer. She's a, she's a great storyteller and they spend a lot of time on the craft piece of it, you know, which is something that I care a whole lot about. um, And I wish I saw, you know, more often from, um, from brands, from companies. And the fact of the matter is they're telling this story in the context of Basecamp. I mean, you're on Basecamp site, it's Basecamp's magazine, so the marketing is inherent. You don't mm-hmm. have to hit readers and viewers, listeners over the head with selling them something because mm-hmm. they're already there in your ecosystem, and now you're sharing another side of it. And I think a lot of brands, um, you know, fearful brands, lose sight of that, think, well, we got to sell them something. Mm-hmm. You know, they're here, but they're already in your classroom. They're in, you know, in your ecosphere. So just go ahead and let the story play out. Your brand ethic is going to come along with that, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I think um, Slack does a good job with it, too. I saw you talk about them in your, your talk as well. And if you wouldn't mind covering that, I think they do a beautiful job with storytelling. Yeah, yeah. Slack is another one of my favorite companies who I think just really kills it in this area. Um, so what Slack does, I mean, Slack does a lot of great a lot of great marketing. Um, But one of my favorite pieces of content marketing that they produce is a podcast that comes out every two weeks called the Slack Variety Pack. And what it is, is a uh, literally a half hour kind of audio variety show that's not about Slack. It's not about the technology. Instead, it's about um, people who have found their purpose and tech culture, you know, which is very much aligned again with with the ethos of Slack. Um, Slack is, if if your listeners don't know it, um, it's one of the fastest growing business to business applications ever uh, co-founded by Stuart Butterfield, who is also the co-founder or the founder of Flickr. Um, and it has just tremendous growth momentum up behind it. It's a team communication tool that allows um, really anybody, any whether you're in the same company or, or, or not, um, to communicate really seamlessly. It sort of takes the place of a lot of messaging apps as well as email. So what I love about their product, that, they're, that their content product called the Slack Variety Pack, um, is that it's, you know, it's telling a bigger story because it's not about Slack. Um, instead, it's about, you know, sort of these interesting stories um, that are related to the business of work. The goal of that is to, is to do two things. First, it's to tell the story of Slack, which is, you know, this fun, fast growing company um, that helps to make work less worky is, is the way that they talk about it. Um, that's one, one part of what they're trying to do there. But they're also trying to just use it as um, Bill McKaitis, who's the CMO of Slack, told me the best landing page ever. So I love this idea of, you know, creating a podcast as the best landing page, the best introduction that you could ever have to Slack, because it's engaging, it's fun, it's interesting. And it's not about the company. But again, it's very much aligned with sort of the ethos of Slack. Mm hmm. And as you were, t- you, you, you were talking about that, something occurred to me that marketers and especially traditionally trained marketers are trained to promote within a medium, but not mm-hmm. necessarily trained to message to push that medium further or, or, or take advantage of the medium as a medium in and of itself. Right, right. Am yeah. I making sense? I mean, they're really good at, at, at putting together 30-second commercials, 60-second commercials, trying to sell you something in a medium. But what you're talking about here is these folks are creating their own medium. I mean, yeah. true content. Yeah, yeah, they kind of are. The other thing that I really love about their podcast is that they, like, you know, again, the goal of this is to make it the best landing page that they could ever hope to create for Slack. So in other words, to make the best introduction to Slack that anyone could possibly have. And so what they do with this 30 second or 30 minute podcast is that they take the three or four stories that make up that 30 minute podcast and they slice them up individually. And then they release those individual segments which are, you know, maybe, you know, four or five, six minute segments individually on a separate channel called the Slack, uh, Slack single servings. And, you know, so again, why do they bother to do that? Why do they sort of produce the same content in two different ways? It's because they're trying to make it 
you know, be, they're trying to help it be spread and shared as far and wide as they possibly can. And so they know that listeners who really resonate with a particular segment will go and share that, that, you know, three, four or five minute segment, but they're not going to share the whole 30 minute show and then say, oh yeah, fast forward to like minute 19, right? That's not going to happen. Um, and so they've really thought it through. They're really, they're really pretty smart about the way that they market the show as well as the way that they produce it. So it's almost kind of like a form of A-B testing. They get to go with a 30-minute epic or they do the little bite-sized episodic version mm-hmm. of the same type of storytelling to, de- well, I guess to really fit the needs of different audiences, but share yeah. the same content. That's very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, you are the author of a, a few amazing books out there and, of course, all of your work at Marketing Profs. I'd like to take a break at this moment just to let some of our sponsors tell their stories. But when we come back... Can we talk a little bit about Everybody Writes and pull some of that knowledge out of you and give our listeners some tips on how they can be better, not only at writing, but at better storytelling? That works for you. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Anne. We'll be right back right after this. Hey, if you like what you're hearing here on Business of Story, then you are going to love Definitive, the email from Convince and Convert that many marketers say is the most useful resource around. Each day, the team at Convince and Convert picks a topic and sends you the three best resources ever created about that topic. It's topical, it's timely, it's useful, so go to definitivedigest.com and subscribe for free right now. Hey, I've got a question for you. What's the best call-to-action button color on your website? Yeah, you probably didn't see that one coming, did you? Well, what's the best shape and sizes of your CTA buttons? And what copy gets more clicks? You know, these questions have interrupted my sleep patterns for weeks now until I downloaded a helpful new email marketing guide from Emma called Why We Click, The Psychology Behind a Great Call to Action. You'll learn how applying just a little bit of brain science can transform your CTA buttons into small but mighty conversion powerhouses. It covers the button color, copy, and placement that helps skyrocket click rates. Check it out at myemma.com forward slash click. You know, Emma helps marketers everywhere send smart, stylish email newsletters, promotions, and automated campaigns, and help us all rest a little easier knowing our email marketing is doing its job. So check out their new publication at myemma.com forward slash click. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, Anne Hanley. It's so great to have you on the show. I, you were introduced at Social Media Marketing World as what? The first lady of content marketing? Is that what they said? I mean, Did they? Hmm. It was something like that. You came on and I think I even saw a little blush of red when you walked on after that. <laughs> I, I really liked it. I really, really enjoyed Thank uh, you. the presentation. Now, you've got a terrific book out there, Everybody Writes. Everybody Writes, your go-to guide to creating ridiculous ridiculously good content. So for your average writer out there, why should they get this book? What is it in there that can turn me as an average writer into, you know, a pretty good writer? What do you think <laughs> in there? So I wrote Everybody Writes because I really wanted to create um, – you know, sort of an elements of style for a content marketing age, essentially for a, for, you know, a new marketing age. And in my experience, you know, I've been editing business writers for probably about 25 years or so. Um, and one of the things that I realized was that, you know, most writers out there are not particularly confident writers. Um, and at the same time, many people have not read a writing book or, or even taken a writing class or any of that stuff really since high school, sometimes college, depending on what they majored in. Um, and so what I wanted to do was, was create a book that would do two things. First of all, just help people up their writing game, you know, by giving them some guidelines and and help them build their writing muscles a little bit. Um, But I also wanted to give them some inspiration. And so I wrote Everybody Writes to be a really fun writing book. Um, And that's pretty much the feedback that I get. Like if you go to Amazon and and you read the reviews, I have so many people on there who say, like, thank you for writing a book about writing that isn't boring. Because I thought, you know, if I'm going to actually challenge people to be better writers, I better write it in a way that feels accessible and fun and interesting and isn't isn't really just going to put people to sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
that's really why I wrote it, and that's really what I what I hope to deliver. Each one of the chapters, I, I, I can't remember exactly how many chapters there are. There's like 70 something chapters. Mm. I think that that's um, that's part of everybody writes, and. Uh, I really wanted to. I wanted each one of those chapters to feel really accessible. You know, I wanted you to be able to open it up at any point and just sort of start. You know, reading about something you feel like you needed help with, um, and to make it, like I said, inherently readable and memorable and just sort of fun. Are there two or three tips that seem like they're really universal across the board? They're like the go-to low-hanging fruit tips that everyone should do to just start upping their game in writing. Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, I think the biggest thing that I see poor writers doing is not taking the time to self-edit. Um, a lot of, of, of early bloggers, I think, you know, sort of have fall into this category. You know, people would think that writing is really just barfing up that first draft and then publishing it. And I think it's, you know, that's that's disrespectful of the reader, you know, ultimately. But I also think it it's, doesn't really do much for you. I think it's much more effective to, you know, barf up a post or throw up that post, you know, <laughs> what I mean by that <laughs> is there to sit down and just, you know, like right through everything that you just, I just did a, a motion, by the way, like when I just did that, <laughs> that was like my hand motion in the background, which you can't see. Like um, but, uh, but yeah, so that puts a picture in your head, I guess, maybe not a very attractive one, but, <laughs> um, but what, you know, what I want people to do is, is like, think about that first draft, you know, just, just say what you want to say, get everything out there. Um, and then give it some space, like sort of let it ripen overnight, you know, as, as, um, like the way that, a a rock hard avocado might, if you put it inside a paper bag on your kitchen counter, you know, let it ripen into something that's a little bit more, um, more friendly, you know, mm -hmm. so then go back the next day and, um, and really, what, what I talk about in the book is swapping places with your reader, you know, so, so you write something, you barf it up, and then you go back the next day, and you sort of think about it from the reader's point of view, you know, is this, does this make sense? Um, you know, am I actually respecting the reader's time? Do I understand what I'm trying to say? You know, is my point clear? Um, going through that list of questions that I, um, that I, I, I have in the book. And I think just that alone would make such a huge difference in terms of the readability and um, the, the articulateness of, mm -hmm. of most business writing out there. Can you take us through the day, a day in the life of Anne Hanley in her tiny little house writing a <laughs> blog post? Uh, what, what, what is your exercise and how long does it take you? Because I'm with you, you know, when we first started writing blogs, it's like, oh, don't worry about it. Just get it out there. Don't worry about typos, you know, just crank it out and get as many out there as you can, which kind of flies in the face of really good writing. So what, what, yeah. is, what is your process? Yeah. I mean, I would say that I, you know, I think there was a time in internet publishing and online publishing that you actually could do that. I don't think we can do that anymore though, right. because the volume of content is just so great these days that, you know, you will just be, you'll just be left behind. And so that's really why I think we need to pay attention to this stuff is that, you know, looking at the content that you're producing as an opportunity to, you know, put your best face forward, to do something different and to really engage the people you want to engage. So, um, so that to me is, is really key. Uh, so in terms of my process, um, I am probably not anyone you'd ever want to emulate because I, as I mentioned, I am an incredibly slow writer. Um, I am, first of all, I'm, I'm really exacting. You know, I, I take everything that I put out there, uh, pretty seriously. I never rarely just toss something up. Um, I actually, I don't think I ever have. I mean, aside from maybe tweets on, on Twitter, I'm pretty particular about everything that I post. Um, Annoyingly so. I mean, I will just, I'll cop to that. Uh, but my process is really to think about what I'm, what the main point that I'm trying to make in a particular blog post. And I, I write it at the top of the page, whether I'm writing it out like in a, in a notebook, which I sometimes will do, or or, you know, just typing it in a, in a Word doc or something like that. I try to encapsulate what I'm trying to say, you know, in a, in a sentence before I begin a piece, just because it, it sort of, it functions as kind of a, a beacon on a beachhead, you know, it kind of mm -hmm. gives me a direction to, to go toward. Um, so I'll do that. And then because I have kind of a, a tendency to procrastinate in my writing, I will write a literally a grocery list. It looks like a grocery list of the key points that I think, you know, that I want to make in, in the, a particular piece. Um, and so making them as key points as, as kind of, um, like bullet points or like a grocery list, it, it makes me feel 
like it's a little more doable because, um, you know, it's uh, writing is hard, right? Mm-hmm. Writing is can be really uncomfortable, even for people like me who love to publish. Um, I still don't particularly love writing. I love to have written, you know, like a lot of oh, yeah. a lot of writers, I think, would agree with that. Um, so that's kind of my process. And then I just start to put flesh on the bones of those particular bullet items from there. And the first draft is spectacularly ugly. I mean, it's really ugly. It's not just like, oh, yeah, you say that's ugly in the way like, you know, oh, I know I, I don't look very cute today, just so people will say, no, oh, you look really cute. It's, it's not like that. It's that it's really bad. Um, and uh, so I really definitely need to set that aside. And usually I'll come back to it a couple hours later, sometimes the next day, depending on uh, what I have going on. And and on average, how long does it take you from start to finish with, for a blog post? Oh, man. Um that's a that's an interesting question. I don't know if I could really quantify it. I guess it's probably a couple of days from mm-hmm. start to finish uh, if I really am focused on it. Um, yeah, I mean, like I just published a piece on my own blog last week, and I think that that post took me about a week to do, but it was a little bit longer. And I was also traveling a bunch in the middle, so I was, you know, I kind of had a I had a fractured approach to it just because of um, of travel and just not really being able to focus on it. So I, I think on on average, though, probably a, a, I would say for me a good a good four or five days. I mean, that's not consistently working on it. That's right. setting it aside, picking it back up again. Um, but yeah, it does. It, I'm I'm a slow worker. When it, I was in when, when I was in fourth grade, I'll, I'll just say the qu- quick yeah. aside. When I was in fourth grade, I got a report card, and my teacher wrote on the report card, like in the comment section for my parents, she wrote, uh, "Tries hard but works slowly." And I thought for the longest time that I was impaired in some way, you know. And uh, now I realize she was pretty much right on. I do try really hard, (laughs) but I'm a really slow writer. I just am. Those fourth grade teachers are like the wicked witch (laughs) in the West. That that stepmother that it's just like, I mean, come on. I just, we recorded a guest an hour ago on the show and she also talked about a fourth grade teacher that disparaged her in her storytelling. And I can think of Mrs. Ring, my fourth grade teacher. She would backhand you, and you had to be ready to be, to duck because that would go flying right over the top of your head. And if she wow. had a little bit of your hair, it really pissed her off. If she missed you altogether, it didn't seem to bother her. But if it was a glancing blow, it was a problem for her. <laughs> <laughs> and then my final question in your process, Anne, do you have a set goal, a uh, number of podcasts or I'm sorry, blogs that you want to put out a week, a month or whatever? Are you caught up in that sort of mill of cranking them out? It doesn't sound like you are, but you know, I mean, a lot of us have like, man, I'd like to get at least one, if not two, really good if I get three out in a week, but then they just kind of sit in your psyche and eat away at it at you when you can't get to them or spend the amount of time on them that you do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, you know, I mean, if you looked at my personal blog at annhanley.com, you know, you would see that I published a post in December. And I had a you know pretty good cadence going before that. And then it was pretty much, you know, crickets until last week. So I, I had a really good long stretch there where I didn't publish anything. Um, part of that was because I had a really tra- crazy travel schedule. I was doing tons of speaking um, and I just, you know, really didn't have the time to commit. It actually was terrible for me because you know, it, th- there is this sort of, um, it, there, there was sort of this worm that got in my head that was like, you know, I had this fear about publishing again on my own blog after a six month hiatus, because, you know, I just had this sense that, you know, it's, it has to be really, really good because I haven't been on there for six months. And so I sort of built it up into way too much. Hmm. Um, and so like for me, I think the perfect cadence is every couple of weeks if I can, if I can get to it. Um, but I should say too, that I have no pressure whatsoever to publish on my own blog because, you know, I have marketing profs. I have a day job. There's tons and tons of content that's going on marketing profs every single day. And so, you know, that's, it, that's something that it's, it's definitely a, um, a frequency there where, you know, it's, it's, um, I can't, I can't not publish on there, but I'm not doing all the writing on there. I'm just, I'm just sort of, um, you know, helping the people who work with me Mm -hmm. create, um, you know, get that on the web, you get it out there. So it's, it's not nothing that I'm putting out personally. Um, but, um, so yeah, so I guess every month or so would be awesome for me, but at the same time, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to find the time. 
Well, and being the first lady of content marketing, you have earned that hiatus that you get. To go <laughs> off, is that right? You know, that, you know that's just not handed to somebody. Even if they do make up their own title, it's not just handed to them. You, you do amazing work. You know, thank I mean, you. Marketing process is really incredible. Um, thank you for being here. How can people learn more about you? I probably don't even need to say that because most people, I think, have heard of your work. But where where would you like us to go? Uh, my personal site at annhanley.com. And I just told you how infrequently you'll hear from me. So that seems perfect. <laughs> um, no, or you can follow me on Twitter. I am at Marketing Profs or I am also at Ann Hanley. I have two Twitter handles on there. Um, or you can connect with me via Marketing Profs as well. So my last question is, do you write short stories on tiny little walks from your tiny little house? <laughs> I'm going to steal that. <laughs> I hope you do. I please, uh, I, I hope you do. Well, thank you, Anne, so much for being on Business of Stories. It's just been an absolute pleasure having you here. Yeah, thank you, Park. It's been very, very nice to talk to you, too. Well, and thank you all for tuning in to another edition of Business of Story. I think we're up around 50, 51, 52 now. It's been great fun. We launched it in July of 2015, and it has just been taken off. I've just been having a blast with it. It gives me a chance to meet wonderful people like Anne and to have story art artists on here from around the world to help you learn how to craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And as we hear time and time again, I'm a big believer that we were all at the top of our storytelling games when we were in kindergarten. And like Anne's fourth grade teacher and my fourth grade teacher and Jenny's fourth grade teacher, for some <laughs> reason, that storyteller inside of us gets silent. So if this <laughs> show does nothing else, it is to give you the permission to go out and shout your big, brave stories from the tops of the mountains and have fun doing it. And uh, while you're out there doing it, please visit iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. Give us a rating, share your thoughts. And if you have an idea for a guest or a topic, please send me a note at uh, park at businessofstory.com. And until next Monday, when we will have another crazy, fun story artist, have a wonderful life. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Oracle Marketing Cloud, Park & Co., Sixter, Zignal Labs, and ACT, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts. Podcast imaging by... Audio.